Welcome to Tikva Radio Show, The Sound of Hope. I'm Liliana Inez, your host. Someone once said that God speaks to people in different ways. Did you ever have dreams, visions, or a special experience in which you felt God was speaking to you? The Torah tells us that Abraham, Jacob, and many others heard and experienced God. Does Adonai speak to people like that nowadays? On Tikva Radio, we interview people who have had an encounter with the God of Israel, a special experience. Some have even had personal miracles, and all have found the Messiah of Israel. Stay tuned to Tikva Radio Show and hear an amazing story of someone who was encountered by God. Welcome back to Tikva. Today our guest is Dr. Robert C. Newman. His doctorate is in theoretical astrophysics from Cornell University. He has done additional graduate work in cosmic gas dynamics at the University of Wisconsin in religious thought at the University of Pennsylvania and hermeneutics and biblical interpretation at Westminster Theological Seminary. He is co-author of several books such as Genesis 1 and the Origin of the Earth and What's Darwin Got to Do With It? and many articles and publications such as Astrophysical Journal, Planetary and Space Science. Welcome back to Tikva Radio Show. Today we have Dr. Robert Newman back with us. And this time he's going to be talking about the scientific objections to evolution. Welcome back, Dr. Newman. Glad to have you here with us. Thank you, Liliana. Good to be here. All right. So what are the favorable evidence for evolution in your uh, opinion? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> there are a number of evidences that look on first sight to be favorable to evolution. Uh, one of these is evidence that the Earth is old, some four and a half billion years old. And that's one reason why young Earth creationists are very concerned to defend the idea that the Earth is only a few thousand years old. But I think that's, they're mistaken on that, and that's a bad way to go. Uh, it looks like the Earth is some four and a half billion years old, that initially, as we look in the geologic record, the uh, strata that have been laid down, there's no life, but that's a very short period of time in which we see no life. By uh, perhaps 3.8 billion years ago, life shows up. Almost as soon as the Earth has cooled off enough so as not to cook meat. Right. That's and a good then point. there's just simple life. And then, or much more recently, about uh, uh, 550 million years ago, there's what we call the Cambrian Explosion, in which uh, quite a variety of living things shows up. Almost all of the basic body plans uh, that we see today show up uh, in what we call a Cambrian Explosion. And then after that, we have fish appear, and then amphibians, and then reptiles, and then birds and mammals, and then apes, and finally humans. So we've got this progression, and uh, many people see that as favorable evidence for evolution. And then when we look at the biochemistry, the, uh, uh, the kind of chemistry that uh, biological things, living things have, uh, we see that there are similar biochemicals among the various different kinds of living things that are out there. And then when we look at those uh, animals that we call vertebrates, uh, the one animals that have uh, uh, basically a backbone, rib cage, uh, typically four uh, uh, limbs. Uh, <clears throat> we see uh, very similar bone structures there. So uh, uh, we have uh, this sort of favorable evidence as far as uh, one might say uh, uh, seen superficially uh, seems to favor evolution. Homology. Um can you explain that? It's uh, like an attribute that has a common origin. Is that part of that evidence for evolution? That's the similar bone structures. Uh, okay. There are other things that uh, we could call homologies. But okay. uh, homology is a general term for similar structures among uh, different living things that suggest uh, to evolutionists anyway that these things are related. Okay. And, uh, that's one possible interpretation of it. Uh, another possible interpretation.
interpretation is that uh, uh, they are uh, of similar design. For instance, if you look at a sequence of Ford automobiles over 20 or 30 years, you will see lots of similarities between them, but it's not because they naturally developed from one into another, but because there was designers and they had reasons of one sort or another for uh, 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 having things that uh, are similar from one model to another, and we'd have to examine what those might be. Okay, so just because they have similar structure doesn't mean they're directly related to each other, is what you're saying. It could mean that, but it doesn't necessarily need to mean that. Okay. And so uh, there are these uh, uh, problems, which I'm going to get into here, okay. of uh, evolution. Huh? So why doesn't everybody believe in evolution? Well, uh, <clears throat> the uh, media typically represents that as only religious people don't believe in evolution, and uh, uh, that's just that's just the reason why we shouldn't believe in them if we're not religious, okay? Uh, but uh, there's actually a variety of reasons why everyone doesn't believe in evolution, and it will depend on one's worldview. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are some people who have other sources of information besides science that raise questions for them. And these kind of uh, sources are often religious sources. Uh, but not everybody who is opposed to uh, evolution has it for religious reasons. And I think of uh, Michael Denton, who uh, wrote a book uh, back in the 80s, uh, Evolution, a Theory, and Crisis, and then uh, uh, wrote another book on uh, design in the, uh, in the universe. There's a fellow, Dean Kenyon, who was... Uh, the author of a book on evolution, and then uh, in thinking through uh, biochemistry, basically, he came to believe that uh, uh, <clears throat> that uh, biochemistry and uh, its uh, diversity and its uh, way it uh, works together with living things really cannot explain uh, be explained by uh, uh, purely natural causes. And then there's this fellow Hubert Yockey, uh, who's a uh, uh, specialist in information theory, uh, how uh, uh, information can be uh, uh, moved around and how it functions and that sort of thing. And he came to the conclusion that uh, uh, everywhere you see information, you're looking at the activity of a mind and that uh, the DNA uh, in living things is uh, a perfect information system, a system for transmitting information uh, from generation to generation within living things. So those are some examples of people who object uh, to evolution, but not for religious reasons. Mm -hmm. And then there are also some people who have religious reservations about evolution, but don't think that these are the decisive problems. Now, I would fall in that category myself. Uh, mm -hmm. That is, uh, I think that the <clears throat> Genesis account works better uh, with a... Uh, uh, a uh, creationist alternative, I'm an older creationist, uh, than it does with a theistic evolution model. But I think the biggest problems are scientific problems, not uh, religious problems, if you like. So uh, that's why not everybody believes in evolution, though in fact it is uh, very widely believed in scientific circles. Okay, so you believe that... Um the world was uh, created by a creator, but yep. your, your reason for believing that evolution is not the answer uh, to the question of how everything evolved on, on Earth is based on scientific evidence. What, um, uh, I'll, I'll back up with one question is, how, what percentage of scientists do you believe actually believe in evolution? Well, that's hard to tell, uh, because uh, there's a very strong sociological pressure there. Uh, some years ago, I believe it was Nature magazine, but I may be wrong which one it was, uh, was skeptical that there were many people in the scientific field who uh, didn't believe in evolution. And it said uh, it would offer a free year subscription to the magazine Nature to any person who would... Uh, uh, write to them and tell them that they were not an evolutionist. And one fellow wrote and said, uh, uh, <clears throat> that's a stupid thing. Uh, 
a, a person is in danger of being uh, uh, wiped out in their career, if you like, if they admit to not being an evolutionist, and they're going to do that for a one-year subscription to Nature magazine. Wow. So, uh, so the point the uh, writer was the uh, yeah, writer was making uh, when he responded that way was that uh, because of the uh, political correctness, we might call it, of uh, evolution, in, particularly in scientific circles, uh, it was very dangerous to a person's career to admit that they're not evolutionists. And uh, in fact, we have a number of uh, Christians uh, who have come out and said that uh, uh, evolution really does not fit uh, the evidence of science, and they have really gotten dumped on. So uh, uh, I think uh, that is certainly true. So the answer would be a pretty small minority of scientists are willing to admit they're not evolutionists, but there may be a good bit more, and I have no idea what size group, uh, that uh, uh, secretly think that, uh, but are not willing to talk about it publicly. Yeah. Not only in science, but in education. You've right. got very strong pressures uh, to affirm evolution. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the attempt is to make uh, non-evolutionists look like crackpots. And unfortunately, there are some non-evolutionists out there who are crackpots. Uh, uh -huh. But there are some evolutionists who are crackpots as well. So uh, uh, you get a lot of spin that you have to watch out for there. Yeah. And what we really ought to be doing is paying attention to the evidence. Okay, and so you base your belief on scientific evidence. So um, now, what do you have something that you want to start up with in terms of the evidence? Um, I know you in your paper you talked about the blind watchmaker. Um, is that something that you want? You know, you would like to share? Yeah, uh, my uh, paper, Creation Evolution Debate, which I sent you a copy of, uh, was concerned here with scientific problems rather than philosophical or theological problems for evolution and was concerned especially with problems facing what we might call naturalistic or blind watchmaker evolution uh, rather than theistic evolution. Uh, I have problems with theistic evolution as well, uh, but theistic evolution has got way better, uh, what should we say, evidence for it than naturalistic evolution does, because in theistic evolution you've got a mind behind the universe that could cause these things to happen. But the uh, uh, problems I'm uh, concerned about here is uh, with naturalistic evolution, and that's a sort that was promoted by Charles Darwin back in the middle of the last uh, of the, uh, the 19th century in his Origin of Species, and then particularly promoted here in the late 20th and early 21st century by what we might call the new atheists. Uh, Richard Dawkins in his book The Blind Watchmaker and Daniel Dennett in his book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, and both of them basically, well, three of them basically, argue that we do not need a mind behind the universe to explain uh, the phenomena that we have in, uh, in nature, uh, which they say points to uh, purely natural evolution. And I say they're mistaken about that. There's some big scientific problems for evolution. <clears throat> So what are some now, scientific problems for evolution? Yeah, good. What, what's uh, your thought uh, about that? Uh, in my paper, I deal with uh, two major problem areas, and these include a number of sub-problems under them. But the first one is, uh, <clears throat> when we look at living things, we see an enormously <coughs> complex structure that works together. That, in other words, it's not only complicated, but it's a complicated functionality. So. Uh, the first thing is the kind of problems we have of generating that level of order when in the naturalistic view you've only got random events, uh, which uh, typically are called mutations, and a lot of them are, only got random events, and then you've got some kind of selection mechanism, uh, what we call survival or survival of the fittest. And those two things are claimed to be able to produce all of this order. And I say uh, that when you look at the data, that's nonsense. So that's the first big problem area. And
And the second big problem area uh, that I discuss in a paper anyway is problems with the observed fossil record compared with what that kind of a theory would expect. So uh, those are the two, the two big areas. And then I divide each of those areas into a number of sub-areas. So uh, under problems generating order, I think about the origin of life, the origin of biochemicals, and the origin of chemical processes and complex organs, all of which we see uh, in living things. Uh, where did life come from? How did it arise? Uh, how were all these uh, very complex biochemicals uh, constructed? And then uh, what about the complicated chemical processes that we see in living things and the complex organs? The uh, organs we're thinking of would be things like the eye, uh, things like the digestive system, uh, things like uh, uh, the ability of birds to fly, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, chemical processes would be the kind of chemical processes that uh, uh, take uh, uh, light, uh, radiation, quantums of radiation uh, coming to the uh, being and converting it into a brain signal of some sort, which then the, uh, the creature... Uh, converts into an image of some sort, okay? So uh, uh, lots of complicated things like that. Uh, <clears throat> and then the, uh, so those would be the uh, the three major things I would see there. Origin of life, origin of biochemicals, origin of chemical processes, mm. and complex organs. Mm -hmm. So uh, you had mentioned there uh, in your paper, Darwin mechanism, what, how would you describe that? Darwin's mechanism is basically mutation, that is making uh, small changes in what we now know as the DNA, okay? Uh, Darwin didn't know about DNA when he did it, but uh, he knew that uh, uh, various uh, variation took place in living things, that uh, a, a, a child is not exactly like its parents, there's some differences, etc. And he felt then that certain of those differences would allow things to uh, survive better, and so those would uh, be favored and eventually come to dominate a whole population of descendants, and so that was basically what he claimed uh, was how evolution took place. And uh, stated simply, it sounds pretty impressive. That is, you've got uh, uh, some kind of living thing, and it has these, uh, 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 its descendants have these varieties, and the variety that is uh, best will uh, tend to uh, outperform the other varieties and then survive, and so gradually things get better and better and such. So uh, uh, so many people, after having described that, would say, how can you not believe in evolution? And uh, so the first person, the thing I'd point out is <clears throat> that uh, mutation and natural selection won't even work until there's something capable of reproducing for them to work on. So uh, it doesn't explain the origin of life at all, and uh, when we try and look at uh, uh, the origin of life, there are various ways of defining life, but uh, uh, one way of defining it is uh, a, a living thing is some kind of a machine or such that will make copies of itself. And when we try to uh, mimic that sort of thing with, say, computer uh, simulation or something like that, we find that uh, the simplest sort of thing that will make copies of itself is beyond the capability of chance over the entire history of the universe. Uh, for instance, a, a fellow I met uh, wrote a book on computer viruses, artificial life, and evolution. And uh, he says, uh, computer viruses are the closest things to life that humans have ever created, but even the simplest of these are way too complicated to form by chance. So that, that's the problem of the origin of life. <clears throat> That you can't, things cannot be formed by chance. Uh, <clears throat> complicated, yeah. uh, what shall we say, mechanisms that can make copies of themselves. Uh, they're making copies of themselves. Uh, take a uh, Xerox machine, for instance. Uh, it'll make a copy of a, of a uh, sheet of paper that you put on the platform, huh? Uh, but uh, <clears throat> that sheet of paper won't do what a Xerox machine will do. So a, a, a living thing is more like a Xerox machine that when you push a button, 
it will chunk around a while, and then the out the uh, out tray it will produce another Xerox machine. Huh? Way more complicated. Thing. Yeah, that hasn't happened. <laughs> Just a picture. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. The, that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, the origin of biochemicals may be a little more complicated to uh, uh, understand, uh, but back in the 1950s, uh, uh, two scientists, uh, Stanley Miller and his uh, was the grad assistant, and the uh, uh, I'm not coming up with the name of the uh, who was his uh, advisor, but uh, they did an experiment in which they claimed showed that uh, if we uh, made a simulation of Earth's early atmosphere, and then we shot uh, a spark through it, that uh, it would form uh, biochemicals, which then uh, these biochemicals would uh, uh, merge together, etc., and eventually produce living things. Uh, that experiment, which is called the, uh, well, Yuri, Stanley Yuri was the other, uh, excuse me, uh, you know, I can't remember his first name still. Uh, Yuri and Miller were the two guys. So uh, uh, the Miller-Yuri experiment is really just a very small first step. Uh, <clears throat> it produced oh, a handful of what we call amino acids, uh, the building blocks that when put together certain ways produce proteins, uh, but it was a very small first step. But the, the media and the scientific community uh, hyped out hypes that all out of proportion to its actual importance. Uh, functional proteins have over 100 amino acids each, and they're in very specific order, and uh, this experiment didn't produce those kind of things at all. Oh. So, uh, to make uh, DNA and RNA, which are uh, a rather different than proteins, is a great deal harder. Uh, these require a bunch of different environments. And uh, uh, one writer, who is in fact an evolutionist, uh, has uh, written a book called uh, uh, Origins, I believe it is, uh, <clears throat> in which he uh, uh, kind of describes this, and it's really rather humorous in just a page or two uh, of how the uh, environments would have to change, that this material forming this little pool would have to then go over into another pool that's at a very different temperature and a different uh, acidity, and then that would do some things and have to go into another pool that's very different, etc. And uh, it really suggests that uh, uh, <clears throat> really have not gotten anywhere in that direction. Mm -hmm. So uh, up to this time, the only way that biochemicals have been produced is basically by living things. But uh, scientists have done some things, but they can only do it by using considerable intervention by the experimenter. And when you start getting intervention by the experimenter to make things happen, that's intelligent design. That's not the natural random phenomena. That, that's a good point, what you just said. They're becoming the creator. Yeah. 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 So uh, we don't know whether humans will eventually be capable of producing some kind of life. Uh, but I think we've got very good evidence that if they are, that they do, it will be an indication that uh, uh, intelligent design is needed uh, to make life. And uh, that's uh, not really the direction they want to go. Okay. They're trying to avoid that. And yeah. Yeah. there's a whole issue about the almost like a fear of broaching that subject, that there is a intelligence design that there's a creator behind that. Um, yeah. uh, and, at least among uh, what we might call the leaders or the gatekeepers of both uh, virtually all scientific fields and uh, of uh, uh, education are people who are very strongly uh, materialists. That is people who believe that nature is all there is and uh, whatever we've got here has happened by natural processes and not with any mind behind things. Mm -hmm. And so they're very anxious that uh, uh, people not to, uh, go off in another direction and uh, point to evidence of design. And that's the, the problem then that uh, a number of the uh, intelligent design guys as authors have faced that uh, they're getting a great deal of flack over that particular sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So in your paper you, dis 
you were talking about uh, the fossil record that um, there are some problems with the fossil record and why is, uh, first of all, why is the fossil record so important uh, to yeah, well, prove evolution is what you're saying? Yeah, uh, basically proponents of evolution claim that the fossil record proves evolution. Well, that depends on what you mean and what kind of a uh, alternative, what kind of a creationist alternative you're looking at. If you believe that uh, uh, the history of life on Earth was something that started just a few thousand years ago and that all the living things were made in the course of two or three days, uh, then the fossil record is a serious problem. Uh, and so that's why I have tried to urge uh, Bible-believing Christians to pay attention to the evidence in science that points to one, an old Earth and universe, and two, to the progressive appearance of living things on Earth. Uh, so in that direction, that's, and that's the reason why I uh, pointed out uh, here at the beginning uh, the idea that an old Earth and initially no life and then simple life and then more complicated life is uh, superficially seen as an evidence for evolution, but the big problem is evolution is not an adequate cause for those phenomena. Uh, Hand-waving, okay, but uh, when you actually get down to the details, they won't do it. And uh, so now what I basically suggested on uh, the uh, uh, problems for evolution from the uh, fossil record uh, kind of looks like this. Let me uh, get out my list here to pull them together. Uh, the first thing is that when you actually look at the fossil record, you have what we might call a relative lack of transitional fossils. Uh, in uh, the evolutionary model, uh, everything takes place by gradual transitions, or with a, uh, a, a model that is not as widely accepted, uh, they're fairly rapid transitions, but they're still transitions. And uh, uh, yet, uh, when you actually look at the fossil record, you have very few things that could reasonably be called transitional fossils. I have some quotations here from uh, uh, three significant evolutionists uh, that come from the 70s uh, when a, another model of evolution was proposed. Uh, up to that time, the standard model was what we might call gradualistic evolution. That is, the mutations are very small things, and you have to have lots of them to get any noticeable change. And uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, fellows who were specialists in looking at the uh, fossil record said, that doesn't fit the phenomena of the fossil record. And so let me quote these uh, three things. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who just passed away recently, in the uh, journal Natural History back in 1977, said, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. That is, how rare these are is something that only specialists in the fossil record know. Uh, other people, other biologists outside the fossil record don't typically know it. The evolutionary trees, he goes on, that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. So he says, uh, you know, what we're actually seeing out there doesn't really look quite like what evolutionists would like. Mm -hmm. Another fellow at the, about the same time in the uh, Bulletin of the Field Museum in Chicago, 1979, uh, this fellow said, well, we're now about 120 years after Darwin, okay? Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transitions than we did in Darwin's time. By this I mean that some of the classic cases have had to be discarded or modified. And then another fellow writing in 79, in a book that he wrote, Macro Evolution, uh, <clears throat> says, uh, despite the detailed study of Pleistocene mammals in Europe, that is Europe, uh, mammals in Europe during the last geologic age before the present one, not a single valid example is known of phyletic or gradual transition from one genus to another. So he's saying, well, we can find transitions between species, 
But if we just move up one level in the, far, in the uh, classification scheme to what we call the geni, uh, genuses, uh, we don't see tra uh, gradual transitions. So, uh, uh, so those three quotations are to support my remark about the relative lack of transitional fossils. Notice that we said relative lack. There's no need to argue there are no fossils that might be transitional. There are. The problem is that Darwinian, Darwinian evolution of this blind watchmaker sort, the kind which there's, there's no designer behind anything, that has nothing uh, but these random things to uh, cross gaps and uh, what uh, scientists would call a random walk to cross gaps. Uh, what's a random walk? Well, a random walk is when uh, something moves, but uh, you don't know in advance what direction it's going to move in, and you don't know in a direction how, fa how far it's going to move, that sort of thing. Uh, a, uh, a popular writer some years back, uh, and not discussing evolution, uh, pictured a random walk as a, uh, as a drunk who is not so drunk that he can't stand on his feet, but he's so drunk that he can't control which direction he's going to go to. Uh, and he's holding on to a lamppost, and now he's going to move away from it. Random walk. Mm -hmm. And if we ask, how long will it take him to get home? Uh, the answer probably will be uh, not till he sobers up. Uh, but at least uh, one can calculate uh, how far he will get from the lamppost in so many steps, though you can't tell which direction he's going to go. If, you've, uh, if that's all you've got to go from uh, one form of life to another form of life, uh, <clears throat> you ought to have lots and lots of transitional fossils uh, because it's not going to go straight over, okay? Uh -huh. So, uh, <clears throat> so, so that, yeah, you, go ahead. Have, you have here uh, not a tree, so... Um, that the some fossils that have been found actually don't even resemble a tree. Is that correct? Yes, that is. Uh, let me say one more word about the random walk thing. Okay. That is uh, <clears throat> that uh, <clears throat> uh, Darwin was aware that the uh, that there were not much in the way of transitions even in his time, and he argued that uh, that was because the fossil record was ran it was fragmentary and that uh, as we got more and more uh, evidence uh, those gaps would be filled in but that in fact has not happened uh, oh. we now have uh, nearly a quarter billion fossils uh, in our museums and if you uh, put those together uh, you do not have all of the uh, uh, transitions show up you still got the transition more obvious than they were before. Uh, the example I give is uh, <clears throat> from uh, computer graphics. Uh, how detailed a picture can you make with a quarter billion pixels? And uh, you ought to be able to see uh, details that in fact were not seen. Now, your remark about the shape of the fossil record is an important one, and it was the next thing I dealt with, and that is uh, <clears throat> Darwinism its various forms, uh, whether we're thinking about gradual transitions or more rapid transitions, uh, still predicts that uh, you start out with uh, uh, the simple ancestor and then uh, gradually that diverges into things that are somewhat different and they become even more different as time goes on and more different, etc. And so the picture of that drawn as a diagram would be kind of the, the early living things would be like the trunk of the tree and then the different divergent things would be like branches, and they would get more and more branches. So you'd get a nice uh, single tree, if you like. Uh, but when you actually look at the fossil record, you don't get that. You get instead what looks like a bunch of bushes that uh, at the uh, Cambrian explosion, you suddenly have a wide variety of different body plans for the different kinds of animals. And then uh, each of those diverges some, uh, and uh, so the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> divergence comes uh, in a different way. You get uh, 
the uh, the most basic body plans show up rather suddenly in the fossil record, and then they kind of fill in, and uh, that's not at all what a uh, Darwinian model would have ex ex uh, expected. So why, what do you think, um, the fossil is not looking like, you know, what a, a tree is supposed to look like. You're saying it, it looked like a bunch of bushes. So, so What's the there was a, if as a creationist, as a, uh, intelligent design, you would say that somewhere along the line, God intervened and put, you know, set up um, some things in creation that yes. weren't there before. My suggestion would be mm -hmm. that God is preparing the environment uh, gradually and that uh, uh, he uh, creates certain kinds of living things that can function in the environment on Earth that exists at that time, some of which are uh, active in actually changing the environment. And then when the environment has uh, moved on a ways, uh, he uh, creates other things uh, that will function in that environment. So that uh, some of your early uh, uh, animals uh, <clears throat> uh, really, uh, uh, well, some of your early plants uh, do not need uh, oxygen in the atmosphere to function. And uh, uh, some of your uh, single-celled organisms of one sort or another can actually function without oxygen as well. But eventually they will begin to develop oxygen in the atmosphere. And then God creates uh, kinds of living things that need oxygen at that point. And so you have a sequence like that that is going on. And uh, mm -hmm. we're getting to the place now where we can uh, perhaps mimic a little bit of that uh, by what we would call genetic engineering. Uh, that is, we understand how an intelligent designer can uh, make different things out of what... Uh, uh, what he's got to work with, and we haven't gotten very far in that direction, uh, but at least it allows us to understand what we might be looking at, and I think that's what we really are looking at at this particular point. Mm. Uh, so, uh, what are some other problems with evolution that the fossils are showing us? So, you, you said there's like some amazing number of fossils they found, but if you put it all together with a computer, there, you can't put anything together that makes any sense. It's, well, it's, uh, <clears throat> when you uh, try and put things together, uh, it looks like you're uh, dealing with, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, what should we say, a number of uh, what appear to be separate creations of some sort, maybe not starting from scratch, uh, maybe these separate creations are using something that was there before, but they're doing something to it that require maybe a hundred mutations of the right sort to move from the one to the other, and nothing like that is going to happen naturally. Uh, right. That's going to be uh, an intervention of some sort. Yeah, it goes uh, but, back to the scientists that instead of showing how um, one part of nature went from one stage to another, they went and intervened to try to make it go in the way they think, you know, it, it would turn out right. So they, they start becoming the creator, the intelligent design, and... Um, well, they would like uh, the stuff to happen by itself, if you like. Right. But when you actually do the numbers for the probabilities and stuff, the probabilities are astronomically small, and... Uh, <clears throat> If you've done two or three of those, you just don't have enough opportunities in the history of the universe uh, for that sort of thing to happen. Right. And uh, that's uh, that's really where we are now. Uh, I just uh, got a book in the mail today. It hasn't actually been published yet. This is uh, Uncorrected Proofs. Uh, another book by Michael Behe. Uh, Michael Behe uh, wrote a uh, uh, rather well-known book back in the 80s called Darwin's Black Box. And then uh, about 11 years after that, uh, the book, The Edge of Evolution, uh, Darwin's Black Box said, uh, well, when, we, uh, when, we, when Darwin looked at the cell, uh, he couldn't see anything inside of it. So he just took it to be kind of a, uh, a bag of jelly. Uh, <clears throat> but now we can look inside it. And so it's no longer what uh, uh, scientists might call a black box. 
you can look in it. And uh, we see all these things going on and uh, such. And then in the next book, The Edge of Evolution, he looked at, uh, uh, at experiments that had been done to show what is naturalistic evolution capable of doing and showed that uh, it just is not capable of doing the kind of things that need to be done. And uh, now he's uh, uh, written this work, and I've only read the introduction to it, so uh, I can't uh, I really characterize it in detail, uh, but uh, his title is Darwin Devolves. And this book will come out in uh, February, Lord willing. And basically it's saying that what we now know about DNA uh, suggests that... Uh, uh, that uh, Darwinian evolution is actually something that uh, devolves, it goes downhill instead of going uphill and making better and better things. And uh, I will have to read the full book to uh, uh, see whether he makes it case. But I've been very impressed by his two previous books, uh, that, uh, uh, and from my own reading as well, to uh, suggest that uh, that he's uh, he's got it there. He's uh, he's pointed out something that uh, naturalistic scientists do not want to hear. Hmm. So where are we now? Because at the time of Darwin, we didn't have any understanding about DNA. We're, yep. we're in a different place. So how is that changing um, the whole theory of evolution? I don't think it's made much change yet. And uh, Yet I think it has put a great deal of tension on evolutionary theories. Uh, already back in the 80s, uh, Michael Denton, Australian uh, biochemist, uh, microbiologist maybe, was saying uh, <clears throat> evolution is a theory in crisis. And uh, just here in the last 10 years, uh, he's written another book that says evolution is a theory still in crisis. Well. The evolutionists have not solved that crisis, and uh, my suggestion is it is going to press very hard in the direction of a designer. And uh, what that will do is hard to say, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, humans have been confronted with God all through human history, mm -hmm. and they haven't all come to truth. Uh, many of them have gone off and invented other religions and such, and... Uh, uh, I can't predict the future. I've got biblical material that give us some outline of how things will wind up. Uh, but uh, uh, it's pretty clear in the uh, biblical material that uh, there's still going to be strong uh, rebellion against God uh, running all the way up until uh, uh, Jesus comes back again. And mm -hmm. so uh, uh, that, I think, is the kind of thing we've got. It may be that the evidence developing here is going to lead to persecution of believers, by people who don't want to believe, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some huge polarization in our society already here, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. that may be where things are going to go. I hear you. So, um, if there's somebody out there listening, and they, uh, you know, they're hearing what you're saying, and they, they're like, yeah, um, there's truth to this, uh, what would you say to that person? I would say that uh, uh, we really haven't been able to cover a whole lot here in uh, just a brief uh, uh, what, wait, interview, but uh -huh. uh, I would recommend that they read uh, these books by Michael Behe, that they read uh, the uh, three books by Michael Denton, uh, that uh, they read uh, the books by uh, Stephen Meyer, uh, which I haven't mentioned here uh, tonight, all of these books are pretty substantial. Uh, probably the shortest one is maybe 150 pages, and the longest maybe four or 500 pages. Uh, but a number of them are written so that they can be understood by people that are not really scientists, but the writers are trying to write in such a way that uh, uh, scientists can uh, grapple with what they have to say and see that these guys are, in fact, uh, trained in uh, their fields of specialty, uh, Behe and uh, Denton in science and uh, uh, Stephen Meyer in philosophy of science, and that uh, there really is very good evidence here. Uh, a couple of websites I might suggest. Uh, 
the website reasons.org uh, that's related to the uh, work of uh, uh, Hugh Ross and his associates uh, right out there on the West Coast with you all. I've forgotten the name of the town it's in, but uh, uh, on the Internet, you really don't need to know any of that stuff anymore. So uh, if you uh, go have a look at reasons.org, uh, uh, Ross and his associates, uh, who are uh, a number of them are scientists, uh, are working hard to keep up with what's going on in the scientific literature. Mm -hmm. And they've got very, very good evidence that uh, there's a mind behind the universe, and that mind is the God of the Bible. Well, we so. do, we still have a, a bit more time, and I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, and, and um, as uh, a believer in uh, Creator God, and yeah. intelligence design. So how does the discovery of DNA, the new discoveries, how has that uh, confirmed to you, um, you know, that there is a creator God? I think that the more we've learned about life, uh, I'm thinking about physical life on Earth, okay? So far we haven't found it the life out beyond the earth if there is any else in our universe. Uh, we've got evidence from the Bible that uh, uh, there's God and there's uh, living things that we call angels and such, which uh, we're not sure exactly how they're related to physical uh, life, but, uh, but back where I was going. Uh, <clears throat> the more we've learned about physical life, the more complex we've seen it to be and the more sophisticated we seem to be and the less and less likely, therefore, that uh, unguided processes with nothing stronger than survival of the fittest, if you like, can explain uh, the origin and development, all this sort of thing. So uh, when I was younger, let's see, I'm 77 now, so uh, when I was, say, uh, in uh, high school, uh, evolution was kind of scary. And uh, uh, I thought about it and had contact with people who were not evolutionists and uh, looked at the kind of evidence they gave and uh, uh, still uh, not as strong as I would have liked. Uh, but uh, uh, as I've uh, studied more and more and as more and more evidence has come up, the evidence has gotten stronger and stronger that we live in a universe that's got a mind behind it. And that evidence has not only come in biology, uh, but has also come in what we call astronomy or astrophysics, uh, in the uh, uh, way in which uh, uh, the basic forces of the universe are designed. I think I may have talked about that a little bit uh, last time. And in the, uh, the way in which our, uh, our planet Earth is very, very unusual in the whole of the universe that we know anything about. Uh, as being just right uh, for life on it. And uh, whether uh, our Earth is the only planet in the universe that is just right enough or not, I don't know. Uh, maybe time will tell us the answer to that. But uh, uh, <clears throat> there are now so many things that uh, a uh, <clears throat> just right planet has to have uh, that uh, it's beginning to look like unless it has been designed there's not likely to be even one. We know there's one. Uh, so, uh, again, it seems to point towards a, uh, a uh, mind behind the universe. So uh, that's kind of where I would come down on that whole question. Mm -hmm. So, as a scientist, why, uh, if you were to, you know, encourage some scientists that, you know, they've been raised on evolution, taught that, you know, whatever we see is what there is and there's no such thing as as a creator behind the universe and you believe differently um how you know what would you want to say to some young scientists in terms of their considering um, well i'd say this that uh, if such a person is determined to hold on to a worldview in which there's no god then undirected evolution has to be their explanation no matter how badly it works but if you're willing to consider the possibility that uh, there might be a mind out there, then the uh, 
evidence that we see in nature, in biology, and in uh, what we call astrophysics, cosmology, etc., uh, points very strongly uh, to a creator. Now, we've got people out there, uh, like uh, Richard Lewontin, uh, who wrote back in 1997 in the New York Review of Books. Uh, he says, uh, we take the side of science at an absurdity of some of its constructs. In spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions somehow compel us to accept the material explanation of the phenomenal world. But on the contrary, we're forced by our a priori, that is in advance, adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Uh, well, if you're in that position, you're in trouble. Uh, but if you're willing to look around and see what the evidence looks like, you may be able to find what's really the truth. Now, if you're a scientist, uh, you may be in for some trouble in your career if, in fact, you come down that uh, it looks like the evidence points to a mind behind the universe, because that is not popular now. I don't know whether it will become popular in the future before Jesus returns or not, uh, but uh, our responsibility is to care about what's true and try and live lives in consistency with the truth, rather than, uh, uh, <clears throat> rather than wishful thinking. And so uh, that would be my recommendation uh, to uh, uh, audience scientists, is to keep your eyes open and pay attention to what the evidence looks like, and don't get snowed by hype, but look and see what the evidence really looks like, and follow it. And the Lord will bless that. That's great. So, um... Dr. Newman, you had a book that you co-wrote uh, with um, John Weister. Weister, yeah, John Weister. Yeah, Weister. And Janet and Jonathan Moneymaker. Um, I think it's called uh, What's, What's Darwin got, what to do? got to Do With It? What's Darwin Got to Do With It? A Friendly yeah. Conversation About Evolution. And it's yeah. published by InterVarsity. Yes. Uh, out of print at the moment. Uh, you can certainly look on Amazon and see uh, what's available. Uh, I got a, uh, a uh, Kindle ebook version of it after it went out of print, so I suspect that's still available. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, uh, you may have some trouble finding uh, hard copies of it now. It was in print for 16 or 17 years, from uh, uh, 2000 to 2016, something like that, 2017. So uh, it's a cartoon, a cartoon box, a book, or what's uh, what's being called a graphic novel these days, I guess, and uh, uh, was designed for uh, uh, <clears throat> people who are, uh, uh, what should we say, more visually oriented, and uh, uh, you might find that worthwhile looking at. Awesome. So we just really appreciate you coming on uh, to Take Vow Radio Show again. Um, and uh, is there an email if somebody has a question or a website that you want to give us uh, before we we finish uh, our program? Okay. I, I wish I could give us uh, give you our website ibri.org, but it has been down for about a month. Oh. Uh, some kind of red tape, and uh, I'm not the IT man, so I can't explain that uh, in detail. Uh, my uh, Email, if you want to try and uh, contact with contact me, is rcnewman at rcn.com. Thank you for listening to Tikva Radio Show, the voice of hope. If you have been blessed by this program and want to join us in sharing with others the hope of Yeshua HaMashiach, a gift of any amount will be appreciated. You can donate and contact us on our website at tikvaradio.com 
Once again, that's T-I-K-V-A-H radio.com. Thank you for joining us and God bless.